So once you're ready to go, your assistant would have prepped the back with the 0.5% chlorhexidine lollipop. Make sure it's not the 2% chlorhexidine lollipop. Those also exist. And then the first step would be after setting up your trolley nicely is to put the drape on. So I'm gonna get rid of those now because we won't waste them. So after prepping the back and popping the drape on, first step, bit of local in the skin. I want to do this on that mannequin and give it some time to work. Then I prepare my patient. We're going to be doing the epidural now. I need you to give me my be your best position and um, stay really still. Let me know if you need to move for any reason. I found my space. I'm popping in my tui needle here, waiting till I get a bit of a grippy sensation on that tui needle, which indicates it's in the ligament. And before I proceed, it's really important with hand mo movements here to pop your left hand against the patient as a break or a brace and provide co continuous pressure on the plunger. It really is the plunger pressure that's mostly moving the needle. Of course, this left hand is also moving the needle, but it's also providing counter traction to avoid you going too far or jumping, which can increase your chance of a dural puncture. And slow and continuous pressure on the plunger until you get a very clear loss of resistance. You often get a firmness before you get that loss of resistance. Note where your needle is at this point, and it's often helpful to say it out loud. So in this patient, we're around four and a half centimeters. I'd like four centimeters in the space, which means I'd like my catheter to be at least eight and a half centimeters in. Patient should stay nice and still at this point while we thread our catheter and it should easily thread. If it doesn't easily thread, there's likely an issue with it. The other thing that we like to avoid is threading catheters during contractions as this can lead to increased incidence of intravascular placement. I like to warn the patient as I thread the catheter that they might feel a little bit of an unusual sensation in the back, what I like to call a zing. At Western, we utilize these fixation devices, which are really, really handy and help us keep our epidurals from dislodging, which is a bit of a shame, isn't it? This one, it's helpful to put this on at this point and secure it to the, uh, some dry skin and then pull back your catheter to where you want it to be. So in this case, I've got it at eight and a half centimeters. I then check for a falling meniscus, which is a helpful sign and reassuring that we're not in a, we're in a negative pressure space. And then I always check that we have, excuse me, with negative aspiration, that there's no blood coming back and no obvious free flow of CSF. I can then tell the patient that we're ready to load the epidural and tell our midwifery colleagues as this starts the clock for the epidural observations. I would start with a dose of opioid, usually fentanyl, 50 to 100 micrograms, considering any contraindications, and five mils of 0.2% ropivacaine, um, which will tell me pretty quickly if we're in intrathecal space by obvious motor block or intravascularly by signs of opioid, um, systemic opioid administration. Once we're done with the test dose, I then start to do the the fancy bit, which is make it look pretty in the back. <laughs> I often pop a small tegaderm followed by a large tegaderm on the patient's skin and ask our midwives which side would be best suited for the epidural to come off of the patient's shoulder. And they will pass us some hypofix in order to provide a window around the epidural dressing and then across the shoulder, which hopefully will keep the epidural in, in place. 
The other thing that we really want to see everyone do is put a tegaderm around this filter here, not so that you can't connect anything to the distal aspect of the filter, but around here to discourage anyone from disconnecting the epidural from the, between the yellow bit and the, and the filter, as this can breach sterility and be a big problem if we need to use the epidural for, let's say, an epi top-up Caesar. I usually find that once I've had have the epidural dressed and ready to go with the patient to be put back onto into the bed, I can do a few safety things like ask my patient to move their legs, they should move normally, and see whether they're feeling okay. And they usually feel fine. A contraction may occur, and if it feels quite similar to the one they just had, that's reassuring to me, and I tell the patient, that's a good thing, it means we're probably not in the wrong place. You should find these contractions ease slowly but surely over the next few contractions. Once I've got the patient, I've done those safety checks, I can then proceed to load my epidural with further solution. At Western Health, most people would use 0.2% ropivacaine after the test dose, about five mils, and then wait a further five minutes before giving another dose. What I find helps is giving another five mils at this point, allowing the patient to be on their back, and then go and start documentation, and then coming back and giving another dose after doing a sensory check with ice. Another common way people load an epidural uh, is by popping the 100 mics of fentanyl in the 20 mils of 0.2% ropivacaine, and that's totally acceptable and fine. What we would use as a test dose would be five mils of that solution, um, and the patient would get a lower amount of fentanyl. Um, you can still probably uncover intrathecal and intravascular injection that way. Um, and then five to 10 minutely apart, another five plus five mils. Most epidurals should be at the level that you want, which is around T8 to T10 with 15 mils of this solution. But that some patients, depending on their stature, weight, how, how many babies are inside them, may need less. So it's important to pause between the second and third load to ensure that you're not already, uh, not already high with your dermatome assessment.